This video is a continuation of the preceding. The third of the three major parts of On the Sacred Disease is the speaker's excursus on the brain. The speaker's positive case for the cause of the disease formally began, you will recall, with the assertion that it is the brain that is the cause of the disease. I will explain that clearly, he said, and as we've seen, he did concluding with an explanation of what the southerly and northerly winds do to the brain to trigger the unpurged flux that, if it penetrates the two thick vessels, blocks the body's ventilation system, and with a triumphant assertion that he had thus demonstrated that the disease is no more difficult to know or to treat and is no more divine than any other disease. A denai decretus anthropus Hoti ex udnos hemin kai hedonai ginontai kai, etc., e entelten hoten kai lupai kai, etc., men must know that from nothing else comes our pleasures and joys and laughter and jests than from the place that is the source of our sorrows and pains and griefs and tears, namely, that is, from the brain in which the southerly and northerly winds trigger a flux of phlegm, as he was just discussing. Poro expedit homines nosse, quod ex nulla alia nobis parte voluptates contingunt et cetera quam ex cerebro, itemque maerores et cetera. Cae tutoi pro neomen malista, cae no eomen, cae, etc., and it is with the brain, especially, that we think and we conceive, see, hear, and distinguish the ugly from the beautiful, the bad from the good, the pleasant from the unpleasant. Et hoc sapimus maxime ac intelligimus, et cetera. The brain is the source of all normal, but also abnormal psychological phenomena. Toi de autoi tutoi, kai mainometha, kai para pro neomen, kai, etc. With this same brain, we experience madness and delirium, frights and fears both night and day, nightmares and untimely ramblings and unjustified anxieties, inability to recognize reality and a feeling of strangeness before the habitual, et odem et insanimus et deliramus, et cetera. This being a medical treatise, the speaker then focuses on the causes of the abnormal phenomena. Kai tauta pascomen apotu enkepalu panta hotan hutos me hygiene al e termoteros tes pusios genetai e psychroteros e hygroteros e xeroteros. And we experience all these things from the brain when it is not healthy but becomes hotter or colder or more humid or drier than it is by nature. Atque haec omnia per petemur a cerebro, cum sanum non furet, sed aut calidius quam ex natura fiat, aut frigidius, aut humidius, aut siccius. Cae minometha men hypo hygrotetos, and we experience madness, for example, from moisture. Hotangar hygroteros tes pusios e ananke kinestai. For when the brain is moister than natural, it is necessarily displaced. Hosondan atremise ho en kepolos kronon tos uton kai prone hontropos. But for as long a period as the brain remains still, man also prone exhibits normal psychological phenomena. Et insanimus quidem prae humiditate, cum enam humidius furet quam pro natura neces est moveri. Quanto vero tempore cerebrum quaeverit, tanto etiam homo sapit. These kinds of corruption of the brain are ultimately due to phlegm and bile. Ginetai de he diaphthore tu encepalu hypoplegmatos kai coles. 
fit autem corruptio cerebri a pituita et bile. And in the remainder of chapter 15, he explains in these terms each type of abnormal psychological phenomenon he previously enumerated. We experience two types of madness, for example, with very different external manifestations, one from phlegm, one from bile. Our fears and frights are due to a temporary overheating of the brain caused by bile from our body rising up through our blood vessels to the brain. This ceases when the bile recedes, etc. Kata tauta no misdo ton enkepalon dunamin eke pleistein in toi anthropoi. On account of these things, I think that the brain is the part in man that possesses the greatest power. Et proptera a judico cerebrum vim plurimam in homine habere. Hutos gar hemin esti ton apotu e eros kinomenon hermeneos en hygienon tuncane. For the brain is in fact for us the interpreter of those things that come from the air, provided it is healthy. Hoc enum est nobis e orum quae ab aere fi und interpres si sanum fuerit. Ten de pronesin autoi ho aer par ecetai. The air furnishes it pronesis. Sapientiam autem ipsi exhibet aer. I don't know about you, but I find this to be a remarkable passage. However you translate pronesis, thought, intelligence, consciousness, it pre-exists in and enters the body from the air we breathe, and the brain functions as its interpreter. We saw this idea alluded to earlier when the speaker was explaining the cause of two of the disease's symptoms loss of speech and consciousness. Hoi de ophthalmoi, kai ta ota, kai he glosa, kai hai keres, kai hoi podes, hoia an hoen kepolos ginoske, toi auta hypere teusi. On the other hand, the eyes, ears, tongue, hands and feet merely execute, like servants, what the brain conceives. Oculi vero et aures et lingua et manus et pedes qualia cerebrum statuit ac cognoscet talia sub ministrant. Ginetai gar en hapanti toi somati tes pronesios teos an meteke tu e eros. Joanna deems this is probably the most difficult sentence in the treatise for reasons of manuscript difficulties syntax, and meaning. As you can see, he puts pronesios in daggers, and we call it crux two. In fact, Jones, in his Loeb edition, puts the entire sentence in daggers. Syntactically, the partitive genitive tes pronesios must be taken as the subject of the sentence, which is rare but not without precedent. The biggest problem is its meaning. As written in the manuscripts, it has to be interpreted as meaning that the entire body participates in pronesis for as long as it shares in the air, that is, for as long as the air breathed in circulates via the body's ventilation system. That is exactly how Cornarius took it. Sapientia enum toti corpore contingit pro ut aera participaret. However, as far as Jones and Joanna are concerned, that flat-out contradicts several subsequent statements, which we will call attention to when we get to them, that the brain alone partakes of the pronesis breathed in from the outer air. It interprets what is breathed in and gives command to the eyes, ears, tongue, etc. Estetin sunasin ho enkepalosistin ho di angelon. But concerning comprehension, the brain is the messenger. Ad intelligentiam vero inter nuncius est cerebrum. Joanna takes estin sunasin to mean concerning, with respect to, but note that some take it to mean a destination, an address. 
That bears on what you interpret Xunasis to mean, and we'll come back to that. Hotangar spase to pneuma hontherpos es heoiton, es ton en kepalon proton apignetai to pneuma, kai hutos es to loipon soma skidnetai ho aer, katele loipos en toi en kepaloi heoitu ten akmen, kai hotian e pronimon te kai gnomen ekon. For when man draws the air into himself, the air arrives first to the brain, and in this way it is scattered to the rest of the body, having deposited in the brain that which is most vigorous in itself, that is to say, that which is thinking and contains intelligence. Cum enum homo spiritum in seipsum at traxeret, primum quidem ad cerebrum pervenet, et sic ad reliquum corpus a er dispergatur, relinquens in cerebro suum ipsius vigorum et quicquid prudens ac sapientia praeditum fuerit. Notice the very close parallel between this passage and the one we saw in chapter 7. Going back to Crux 2 in the previous sentence, the speaker here says that the incoming air bearing pronesis goes first to the brain, where it deposits its acme and hotian e pronimon tecagnomen ekon. If it deposits in the brain whatever it has that is pronimon, then how can the entire body participate in pronesis? asks Joanna. Joanna leaves the text daggered, but acknowledges he'd really like to replace pronesios with kinesios, drawing on the crux one passage, which would resolve the ambiguity. But in any case, let's not lose sight of the big point here, which is that pronesis is not a faculty or capability or activity inherent in man, but a concrete property of the air we breathe that is literally deposited in the brain. Egar esto soma proton apic neto, kai husteron eston in kepalon. For if the air were to arrive first into the body and then to the brain, in tesi sarxi kai in tesi plepsi kataloi pos ten diagnosin, having deposited discernment in the flesh and vessels, eston in kepalon an e termoseon kai uk akrypnes, ala epimemigmenos te ikmari te apota ton sarkon kai tu haimatos, hoste meketi enai akribes. Then it would go to the brain, warmed and mixed with the humor from the flesh and blood, such that it would no longer be precise, akribes. Si enum in corpus primum pervenirat et posterius in cerebrum, relict in cannabis et venis dinoteone ac judicio, ad cerebrum calidium iam existens pervenirat et non sincerus et purus, sed amixto humore a carnibus et sanguine, ut non amplaus exacte sincerus eset. This discourse on the brain, as interpreter of those things coming into the body from the outside, is enclosed in another ring composition, such as we've seen before. Di otipemi ton enkepelon enai ton herme naonta ten xunasin. Quapropter dico cerebrum intelligentiae ac prudentiae inter nuncium ac interpretem esse. Note that here the speaker says herme naonta ten xunasin, not ten pronesin. In the speaker's mind, is there a difference between pronesis and xunesis? In fact, one of the many remarkable things about this encomium of the brain is the variety of terms he uses for mental activity, especially in chapter 16. Do you think this is by design, or just an indication that at this time there was not yet a systematic theory of human cognition and a technical vocabulary to support it? In fact, it was far from commonly accepted that our mental activities were centered in the brain. 
and the speaker spends the next chapter refuting two common alternative theories that such activity was located in the diaphragm, the prenas, or in the heart, hecardie. For starters, the name prenas for the diaphragm and its linguistic relation to pronein is, the speaker argues, only accidental and a matter of custom. Ud oida egoge tina dunamin ecusin hai prenas hosta pronein te kaino ein, plain ein, nor do I, at least, know what property the diaphragm possesses for thinking and conceiving, unless neque ego sane noe quam wim habeant praecordia ut sapeant et intelligant praeter quam si. We'll leave the unless clause dangling here for a moment. Cae coelien uc ecosin es hentina cre dexastae e agathon e cacon prospipton and the prenas do not have the cavity that is required for receiving whatever good or bad befalls, that is, that comes into the body from the outside. Et ventriculum non habent ad quem suscipiant aut bonum aut malum alabens. This passage shows how concrete the speaker's conception is of pronesis being deposited in the brain. The speaker thinks in purely physical terms, the diaphragm and the heart have the capacity to feel, he acknowledges, as evidenced by their leaping and throbbing at the sudden occurrence of pain or pleasure. In the case of the diaphragm, that is because it is thin and taut. In the case of the heart, it is because many blood vessels run into it from all over the body and hence connect it to the shudders the body experiences from sudden pain and pleasure. Di oti hecardie aistanataita malista, kai hyprenas, tes mentoi pronesios udeteroi metistin, al hapanton tuton aitios ho encephalosistin. Therefore, the heart and the diaphragm feel aistanatai a jolt of pain or pleasure, but neither partakes of pronesis, but it is the brain that is the cause of all these things meaning of all the normal and abnormal psychological phenomena discussed at the beginning of the excursus. Qua propter, cor quidem et praecordia maxime sentiunt, sapientia tamen minime participiant, sed omnium horum cerebrum causest. And going back to Crux 2 one more time, the statement here, tes mentoi pronesios udeteroi metastin, makes it crystal clear, as far as Jones and Juana are concerned, that pronesis is deposited strictly in the brain and not distributed to the rest of the body. That completes our overview of the three main parts of On the Sacred Disease. The third part, the excursus on the brain, argues for the brain as the source of all human psychological phenomena, normal and abnormal. That doesn't seem remarkable to us, since on the basis of modern science we know that to be true, but it wasn't obvious to the ancients. Is there a precedent among the early philosophers for this assertion of the centrality of the brain? What is remarkable to us is the theory that thought, intelligence, consciousness, pronesis, is introduced into our body from the air we breathe in and is deposited in the brain. Again, is there a precedent? The simple but quite oversimplified answer to these questions would be yes, that the theory of the centrality of the brain comes from the physician philosopher Altmyon of Croton, and the theory of air as the source of intelligence comes from Diogenes of Apollonia. In these appendices, we've been especially interested in the overlap between Hippocratic medicine and early philosophy and we'll close by looking at the case for Alcmyon and Diogenes. Do you remember in our appendix to AWP chapter 8, we saw Socrates in Plato's dialogue Phaedo recounting his youthful enthusiasm for the philosophical inquiry into nature that was all the rage? 
Damastos hos epithumesa, he tells Cebes, tautes te sopias hen de calusi peripuseos historian. In fact, Diels included this passage from Phaedo in his Testimonia for Alcmaion, and at the end of it even referenced two passages you are now familiar with from the brain excursus in On the Sacred Disease. Socrates provides Cebes with particular examples of the types of questions the natural philosophers were posing. Kai poteron to haimastin hoi pronumen, e ho aer, e to pir, e tuton menu den, ho de enkepelosestin, ho tas aisteses par ekon tu akuin kai horan, kai osprinestai, ek tuton de, etc. And is it blood by means of which we think, or air, or fire? Or indeed, is it none of these, but is it the brain in furnishing us the sensations of hearing, seeing, and smell, and from these, etc.? Our speaker in On the Sacred Disease considered and rejected two other organs as the seat of pronesis, the diaphragm and the heart. To consider how wide-ranging the candidates were, though, let's consider Socrates' first possibility, blood, for which we have witnesses from both the medical writing in the Hippocratic corpus and from the pre-Socratics. In fact, it is the theory of the one other work from the Hippocratic corpus that addresses the cause of epilepsy, peripuson, on winds, a.k.a. breaths, Do que demoi caetin hieren kaleomenen nuson tut enai to parecomenon. In my opinion, this is the same thing that causes the so-called sacred disease. He is referring to air, since this speaker's thesis is that all diseases are caused by the action of air in the body. In the case of the sacred disease, air disrupts the flow of blood, which leads to the loss of consciousness one of the symptoms of epilepsy. Why? Hegeomaide uden emprosten udni enai malon ton entoisomati symbalomenon es pronesin etohaima. Now, I hold that no constituent of the body and no one contributes more to intelligence than does blood. Substitute the brain for blood and phlegm for air, and the line of thought is quite similar to that in On the Sacred Disease. It is a marked characteristic of Greek medicine that disease is caused by a change to the customary state. Tutu de hotan men entoi kateste oti mene, mene kai he pronesis, heteroiu menu de tu haimatos metapipte kai he pronesis. So long as the blood remains in its settled state, pronesis remains, but when the blood is altered, pronesis also changes. Among the pre-Socratics, Empedocles appears to have held this view regarding blood. So Porphyry, the 3rd century CE Neoplatonic philosopher, in an allegorical work on the river Styx. Oyetai gar kai homeros in toi haimati enai tois anthropois tein peri tathne ta pronesin. Empedocles de huta painetai hos organu pros sunesin tu haimatos ontos legen. For Homer too thinks that for men thought about mortal things is in the blood. And Empedocles seems to speak as though the blood were the organ of understanding, according to these lines from Empedocles. Haimatos in Pelagesi tetramene antitorontos, teta noema malista kikleskitai anthropoisin, haimagar anthropois pericardion esti noema. The heart nourished in seas of blood which leaps back and forth and there especially it is called understanding by men, for men's understanding is blood around the heart. But let's come back to On the Sacred Disease. Theophrastus, in his work De Sensibus, reports a number of doxi of Alcmaion of Croton that have been compared to our speaker's theory of the brain. 
Philosophers differed on whether or not thinking and perceiving were one and the same. Elkmayon and our speaker distinguished them. Elkmayon men proton ap orisde ten prostas doya diaporan. Elkmayon first defines the difference between man and the other living creatures. Anthropon garpesi ton alon diaperen hotimonos xun iesi. For he says that of all living creatures, only man has intelligence, xuniesi, that the others perceive but do not comprehend, since, Theophrastus comments, pronein and aistanasthai are different things, and not one and the same, as Empedocles thought. Our speaker makes the distinction when he says the diaphragm and the heart perceive pain and pleasure, but they do not participate in pronesis. According to Elkmayan, the sense organs are tightly connected by passageways, poroi, to the brain. Hapasas de tas aisteses sin ertestaipos proston in kepalon. All the sense organs have in some way been bundled together and connected to the brain. Dio kai perustai kinu menu kai met alatontos ten koran. Therefore they are impaired when the brain is moved and changes its place. Epilambanengar tus porus dihon hai aistesis, for it squeezes the passageways through which our sense perceptions occur. In the anatomy and physiology of sacred disease, there is nothing about these poroi, but a tight connection between the brain and our senses is inferred when the author says the sense organs carry out the commands of the brain. Most importantly, Compare the identical notion that our cognitive functions are disrupted when the brain shifts its position. It has also been suggested that this passage in De Sensibus, Os praenestai de risin hamatoi anapnein an agonta to pneuma proston in kepalon, smell occurs by means of the nostrils at the same time as we breathe in, drawing the air to the brain could be the origin of the idea in sacred disease that air breathed in goes first to the brain. Also in the Aetian topic on smell, it is reported, Alkmaion entoi enkepaloi enai to hegemonikon, tutoi un os praenestai helkonti diaton anapneon tas osmas. Alkmaion says the central commanding faculty is in the brain. It is with the brain we smell as it attracts odors by means of acts of breathing. We know very little about Alkmaion and his date is controversial. The best we can say is that Alkmaion's conception of the brain as the central commanding faculty of our cognitive functions must have been familiar to the author of On the Sacred Disease. On the other hand, important aspects of sacred diseases pathology, such as the role of phlegm and bile, and especially of air, find no traces in the fragments of Alkmaion. For air is the source of intelligence, scholars have turned to Diogenes of Apollonia. In our appendix to AWP Chapter 8, we have already compared the doctrines of Diogenes of Apollonia and the AWP author On the Sea's Salinity. Recall that AWP and On the Sacred Disease are thought to be by the same author. Diogenes was contemporaneous with, or maybe a generation before, Hippocrates. He was a neo-monist, that is, he resurrected the Anaximenian idea of a single element or principle from which all material things come. For him, like Anaximander, that principle was air. Furthermore, drawing on Anaxagoras's theory of nous, Diogenes regarded air as being suffused with intelligence. 
We know this from some relatively generous quotes from Diogenes' work on nature preserved in Simplicius's commentary on Aristotle's physics. Anthropoi gar kaita ala zdoia ana pneonta zdoi e toi aeri, kai tuto autois kai psukeisti kai noesis, kai e an tuto apalakte apotneske kai he noesis epilepe. Man and the other living creatures live by means of air, breathing it in. And this for them is both psuche and noesis. And if this is taken away, man dies, and noesis is left behind. Kaimoi doke tote noesin ekon enai ho aer kaluminos hupo ton anthropon, kai hupo tutu pantas kai kubernastai kai panton kraten. And what is called air by men is, it seems to me, that which contains intelligence, noesis, and that by this all men are steered and it has power over all things. Autogar moituto te ostoke enai, kai epipan ap ictai, kai panta diatithenai, kai en panti en enai. For this very thing seems to me to be a god, and to have reached everywhere and to dispose all things and to be in everything. With far less cosmic import, this is exactly what our speaker asserts, pronesis comes to us from the air. Furthermore, in both authors, the air we breathe in circulates throughout the body via the vessels. In fact, to demonstrate this, Diogenes gives a detailed account, preserved in Aristotle's History of Animals, of the path of the air inside the body, and this account closely resembles the anatomy and physiology of the vessels in sacred disease. Theophrastus's De Sensibus is also an important source for Diogenes. His discussion begins by noting the role air plays for Diogenes in sensory perception as well as intelligence. We already saw Theophrastus comment on the distinction between thinking and sensory perception in Alcmaion, and we already made the comparison to sacred disease. Diogenes de hosper dosdein kaito pronein toi aeri kaitas aisteses an apte. Diogenes, just as he does our being alive and our being conscious, so he connects our sense perceptions to air. The air that supplies topronein is pure and dry, and moisture, ikmas, corrupts intelligence. Pronein de hosper electe toi aeri kataroi kaixeroi, koluingar ten ikmara ton nun. Thought, as has been said, is from pure and dry air, for moisture inhibits intelligence. Just as our speaker says, that if the air containing pronesis went to the rest of the body first, the moisture of the flesh and blood, he also uses the term ikmas, would spoil it. Animals, Diogenes argued, have less intelligence than humans because the air they breathe in is closer to the moist earth. Birds breathe in pure air, but like fish, have solid flesh that prohibits the air from completely circulating throughout their body. Plants, not being hollow nor receiving air within themselves, are completely devoid of intelligence. Tada puta diatome enai koila mede anadekestai ton aera pantelos ap erestai to pronein. The diaphragm and the heart cannot be the depository of pronesis, our speaker said, because they don't have a cavity. For Diogenes, then, as for the author of On the Sacred Disease, intelligence is immanent in the external air. But as was the case with Elkmion, there are differences as well as similarities. One is terminology. Diogenes uses noesis and psuche, where on the sacred disease uses pronesis and never psuche. The most significant difference regards the brain. 
In the fragments of Diogenes, there doesn't seem to be a special role for the brain. Noesis, while immanent in the external air, only operates in the receiver when that air is mixed with the blood and with the blood circulates throughout the receiver's body via the vessels, as stated in Simplicius's testimony. Kainoesis ginontai tu aeros syntoi haimati to holon soma katalambanontos diaton plebon. And in this passage in De Sensibus, according to Theophrastus, Diogenes attributed certain characteristics of infants to the fact that their bodies still contain a great deal of moisture, and this moisture prevents the air from circulating past their chest. Hoper kai tes letes aition enai. This is also responsible for their forgetting. Diagartome enai diapantos tu somatos udunestai sin enai. For because the air does not circulate through the entire body, the infant has no sunesis. For the author of On the Sacred Disease, pronesis doesn't circulate, it has a fixed location, i.e. the brain. At least if you resolved the two cruxes we pointed to in chapters 7 and 16 of the treatise to come to this interpretation. In an appendix to chapter 8 of AWP, we compared the author's theory of rain formation to several pre-Socratic sources. We concluded, though, that it didn't look like the AWP author simply lifted his theory wholesale from one or more of the Fusikoi. To the contrary, it seemed that the AWP author might have even made an advance on the philosophical treatises with his argument that the sun attracts all sorts of moisture, including human sweat. It's impossible to say for sure because of the great imbalance between the full treatment we get on these matters in the Hippocratic corpus, on the one hand, and the skimpy evidence we have from the pre-Socratic fragments on the other. The same is true of On the Sacred Disease. And again, many scholars, including Joanna, believe AWP and On the Sacred Disease are by the same author. Let's say that is true. It is clear, on the one hand, that this author was quite familiar with the theories of the natural philosophers. But it also seems he was quite capable of original thought, in invention and or synthesis, and the possibility is worth contemplating that he was himself not just a physician, but effectively also a natural philosopher. The boundary between the two disciplines of medicine and philosophy was not fixed and firm in the 5th century. This is reflected in the historical tradition adopted by the 1st century CE Roman encyclopedist Aulus Cornelius Celsus in his brief history of medicine in the proemium to his work De Medicina. Primoque medendi scientia sapienta ai pars habebator, ut in morborum curatio et rerum naturae contemplatio sube istem autoribus natasit. In the Loeb translation, at first the science of healing was held to be part of philosophy, so that treatment of disease and contemplation of the nature of things began through the same authorities. Ida oque multos ex sapienta ai professoribus peritos eius fuese acipimus, clarissimos vero ex eis Pythagoran et empedoclein et democratum. Hence we find that many who professed philosophy became expert in medicine, the most celebrated being Pythagoras, Empedocles, and Democritus. Huius autem ut quidam credederunt discipulus Hippocrates cous primus ex omnibus memoria dignus, a studio sapienta ai disciplinam hanc separavet, vir et arte et facundia insignis. But it was, as some believe, a pupil of the last, Hippocrates of Cos, a man first and foremost worthy to be remembered, notable both for professional skill and for eloquence, who separated this branch of learning 
from the study of philosophy. That completes our appendix on ancient medicine and on the sacred disease, two works from the Hippocratic corpus we thought you should become familiar with. Our appendices to chapters 8 and 9 of AWP grew a little more extensive than we originally envisioned, and we had to break them into multiple separate video recordings. To reorient you, if you happen to be following these recordings in the order we put them in in the playlist, in AWP we've covered the author's treatment of winds and of water, interspersed with these appendices, and it's now time to go to his treatment of the seasons.